Thank you for that intro. Hi, I'm Alex. My co-presenter here is Ben. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Uh, and we're both software engineers for VS Code, joining you from Zurich. Today, we're going to talk to you about how we build VS Code in the open. We'll take you through some of the principles we try to stick to to make VS Code a successful open source project. And during GitHub Universe, you can join our Discord and you might get some, some VS Code stickers at aka.ms slash open dash source dash Discord. We're also going to have an AMA on VS Code at Microsoft Reactor if you want to learn more after this session. Uh, first, let me introduce you to how the team is set up. We have two physical sites, one in Zurich and the other in Redmond, Washington at Microsoft's main location. We also have several remote members in the US, and of course, even our physical sites now are more distributed. There are 25 engineers, six PMs, two doc writers, one designer, one person in marketing, one UX researcher. All of these team members are spread across the VS Code associated projects, which include VS Code, our components like the Monaco editor, our collaborations with Electron and XTermJS, and many extensions. With that team, VS Code has been one of the top projects on GitHub by number of contributors since 2016. Because of this, we tend to get a lot of love on Twitter, like this very kind tweet. At Code has to be the highest quality open source project I've ever seen. Whoever does their change logs and community management deserves a raise. Uh, this really is a very nice compliment to the whole team because it is the entire team that contributes to change logs and community management. This snapshot of our issues page in our repo was taken in mid-November, and you can see how engaged folks are with the project. The outlines in red are the work that we do, incoming issues, discussions and issues, uh, but in the green, you can see that we also get a lot of love. Lots of people watching, starring, and forking our repo. In addition to being active on GitHub, we have a Gitter for accessibility discussion, which our team actively participates in. And of course, one way the community gets involved is by creating extensions. For extension authors, we have a monthly extension author call where they can have a voice too. The team's work doesn't only happen in the VS Code repository though. All of these other repos are run by us and contribute to VS Code. Included here are the debug extensions, the Monaco editor, the language server protocol, debug adapter protocol, documentation, samples, and much more. To keep all of these projects running smoothly, we try to follow these open source principles. Zero distance, automate almost everything, monthly, get feedback early, and share recurring duties. Now I will hand it over to Ben to talk about the first of our principles. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> so zero distance is the first principle I want to talk a little bit more in detail about. And what this is really about is that we are trying to engage with our users firsthand, we as a development team. So when you are engaging with us, us on GitHub issues, um, for example, you will talk to developers directly. There's no level one support involved. Um, so for that, we keep, for example, uh, our roadmap and iteration plans and endgames plans all public uh, in the GitHub issue tracker. So you're free to see it there, engage, even ask questions, and we're happy to, to comment on them. Besides that, we try to be very active on our social channels. Um, we maintain a fairly popular uh, Twitter account at Code, um, but also Stack Overflow or Hacker News, Reddit, and even on the chat rooms we maintain. Um, whenever there's a new release, we try to uh, watch for feedback and, and engage there as well directly as we, if we see that there are any issues with the new release. But our main source of feedback is GitHub issues, uh, where I think we count two to 3,000 issues per month, which is quite a bit. And in this talk, we will I'm focus specifically on how office. we manage these issues. So you might find some advice here how to do that. We have an inbox tracker, which is a role that we will explain a little bit later to manage these, uh, these issues, and as well as some bots. Uh, as you can imagine, we get lots of customer emotions. Um, I mean, like upvotes in, in from popular my... issues. And 
some of the feature requests that we implemented over the years are a result of these upvotes. Um, for example, tabs, multi-root folders, or even customizable icons are all coming from there because we didn't have them in the beginning. Um, we also get lots of pull requests. Uh, so that's another task we, we uh, do daily. We look at the incoming pull requests and try to merge them in a timely manner. And you might have already seen that we call out on these pull requests in our thank you section. And I want to uh, emphasize that you can actually have a wiki page on our GitHub repository, how to contribute to VS Code. And that clearly explains to you how easy it is to do these pull requests. So I encourage you to do that. Let's look into the um, flow for a feature request, how that can actually go uh, when you file one. So the first thing that will happen is that we receive a feature request. And this is probably most of the issues that we receive. And the first task is to assign a, someone from the development development team to the um, to the issue. This can either be the inbox tracker or a bot based on some machine learning and the content. We actually know which developer is most likely to be the assignee. And then the first task of the owner is to assign a feature area label. Um, and that is really a way to categorize these issues and later find them easier. And then there is a decision to be made if the issue should move to the backlog or to backlog candidates. And that is an iteration that we are maintaining on GitHub where we say everything that is on backlog is something that we do accept and eventually commit to. It doesn't really say when we're doing it, but it's a good sign that we are interested in implementing the feature. But if the uh, developer moves it to backlog candidates, then it's a sign that we are not yet sure if we want to do it. We are waiting for more feedback. And specifically, we want some upvotes here to get uh, community interest in the feature. Uh, and when we have these 20 upvotes, we accept the issue automatically. The bot moves it to the backlog. But after 60 days, the bot will actually close the issue. And this whole flow is meant to really filter out those feature requests that um, really there is lots of interest in, in and that we should do from the ones which maybe have less uh, interest. So if you are wanting to have a feature in VS Code, I recommend you to look at these upvotes and add your vote as well. So in the next slide, want to quickly look into a special iteration that we are doing every year um, because we have been doing it just now. It's our housekeeping iteration. And the idea here is that once per year, we are really trying to get our issue number down by focusing on this for one month. And typically, our magical number for starting this is if we have above 5,000 issues. And you can see here, we just uh, did that in October and November. We are getting down from uh, 5,000 to around 4,000 issues. And we do that by looking for obsolete issues. Tr some of them are fixed. Some of the them will be marked as obsolete or out of scope. Uh, so really trying aggressively to work on them. And one result of this is that, um, for example, in this December iteration that we're about to ship, you will see many feature requests fixed that maybe are a bit older simply because we had time to look at it. And this chart here is done by Benjamin Lennon shouting out here to his, his website. He's uh, not part of the team, but actually a community member that is uh, was willing to do this website where you basically can see an overview of our issues each day. So I know last time we did this, I think the website was breaking down from the traffic. I really hope that today that's not the case. Um, so I give it back to you, Alex. Thank you, Ben. Our second principle is to automate as much as we possibly can and use tools wherever possible to keep manual processes low. We have a CI pipeline that runs regularly so we can catch build and test failures as they happen. And on the right, you can see our pull request CI checks, which help us focus only on PRs that we could accept. We do use ESLint rules to enforce our code layering structure. So you can't push code that creates a dependency that is while we don't have a unified code style, we do still use custom hygiene checks and git commit hooks to maintain a standard across the code base. Our unit tests can be run against VS Code and browser-based VS Code, and it runs in the browser using Playwright. When we're ready to ship, we have a set of automated smoke tests, which replaced original manual smoke tests, and they are just a good sanity check for us. At the top of this page, you can see the header for our internal tools. We use these internal tools to help our monthly to help run our monthly endgame. These tools assign and load balance testing so that tests are evenly distributed and no one feels like they're stuck doing a majority of the testing. These tools also help us make sure we don't miss any community members who contributed a pull request when we write the acknowledgement section of our release notes. 
Below that is our internal builds page. Here we can view builds for different, diff uh, for different qualities. This one is showing a guide and also view builds for stable and for our exploration build. Uh, you can download builds from here. That's what all those icons are. And you can see there are some missing, some icons missing in various rows. The build didn't finish there for whatever reason. Uh, we can filter by commit, uh, filter by release. And then on the right, there are those checkboxes for releasing a build and for freezing a build. So if we put out a build that has a problem significant enough that we don't want further people to be able to download it, we'll freeze it. Since issues go directly to us, part of reducing manual process is giving users the tools to report more meaningful issues. To help with this, we have a built-in issue reporter in VS Code that collects some essential info. If we need further information, I ask users to use our CLI, which provides troubleshooting options, or provide logging, or look at the dev tools. We often get issues that can be traced back to specific extensions and aren't caused by VS Code itself. To assist with finding these extensions, we have a new feature, an extension bisect, which works like git bisect, and will disable extensions in a binary search to help you find the source of an issue. One part of our automation that you may have had personal experience with on GitHub is our triage bot. Our triage bot uses machine learning to determine who an issue should be assigned to based on which feature area the issue is about. The bot will suggest duplicate issues and uses GitHub actions to respond to key label changes and comment contents. One example of this is the needs more info flow, which is shown here. When we get an issue that isn't actionable in its current state because of missing information, like maybe the build number, we can add the needs more info label. This will trigger the bot to add a comment that asks for basic info. And if further information isn't provided, then the bot will close the issue for us after 10 days. One of the most hands-off actions that our issues bot does is respond to incoming issues that aren't in English. Since you're talking directly to us when you create an issue, and since English is the primary language of the team, we require issues to be in English before we start working on them. When an issue comes in that isn't in English, the bot will respond in the original language and ask for a translation. At that point, a community member might jump in and provide the translation. Ben, I'll hand it back to you for some more principles. Thank you. Um, so the, our next principle is uh, involve the community. And what we mean by that is that we are really trying to get some of our community members that are very active to help out on our issue tracking. And you can see here John Moray, who is one of these top community members um, that has some special rights here to trigger an action with our bot by confirming an issue. So in this case, an issue came in and we maybe didn't have time to look into it yet. And he was already confirming it with some steps how to reproduce. And then the bot adds this label. And that is incredibly useful for us to distill these issues because we know they have been confirmed and we don't have to try to reproduce it. Um, another example in the next slide is uh, something that Joe has been started here from our team. It's the author, verif request, author verification requested label, um, which triggers quite a bit of activity, as you can see on the issue. And the idea here is that once an issue is closed and was fixed by a developer, we want the author to verify the issue. And we actually have a process that says every end game, every end of an iteration, we verify every issue we fixed because we believe that's the only way to really know that an issue has been addressed properly. And ideally, it's someone else verifying that issue, not the one that closed it. But here with this uh, bot, we can actually trigger an action that uh, asks the user to verify the issue once an insider's build is out. And an insider's build is a nightly version of VS Code that always includes the changes from the last day. And this bot is actually smart enough to track once the insider's is released and then ask the user to verify it following these steps. And in the end, the user can set this verified label and we have the whole end-to-end -end experience here without a developer having to work on it at all. Back to you, Alex. Thank you. Our next principle is to ship monthly. And that involves shipping predictably and with high quality. To do this, we operate on four to five week cycles. During the first week of each iteration, we take the time to reduce debt, work on tools, and plan the rest of the iteration. Team members use their discretion to determine which debt should be worked on or what tools improvements should be made. 
is debt week. And it's one of the reasons that the code base is still in such good condition after nine years of work. The next couple weeks of the iteration are used to execute on the plan that was made during the first week. Team members usually have ownership over a whole feature area, which prevents one person from getting blocked on another's work and allows for a lot of autonomy over feature distance. As we complete features, we demo them during our daily team stand-up. During this time, we meet weekly as a team to see how the plan is progressing. In the last week of an iteration, we have Endgame. During Endgame, everyone stops working on features and we all focus on getting ready to ship. Once we've shipped, we watch for new issues and make a recovery release during the following iteration if needed. Recovery releases are small patches to fix important new issues after a release. An issue meets the bar for recovery if it's a regression, if it's breaking a feature, or if we know we will get lots of duplicate reports if we don't fix it quickly. Endgame involves all of the steps we need to do to make sure we're ready to ship. It's run by the Endgame champion and Endgame buddy. During Endgame, everyone writes tests, plans, everyone tests, everyone fixes, and everyone writes documentation. And yes, this means that the devs write the docs. There's an edit pass from a doc writer, but the docs were written by us. The Endgame champion is supported by tools, but the role is still manual. The first step for any Endgame champion is to use the template to create an issue for the Endgame plan, which you can see our Endgame plan from October here. The Endgame champion is responsible for and for following the plan. Many users love our release notes, and we do work hard to make sure they're worth loving. During Endgame, we use our weekly team-wide meeting to read through the release notes and make sure they're comprehensive, useful, and full of gifts. And I will hand it back to Ben for our last two principles. Yeah, here we go. So uh, this one is a very important one to me personally, always get feedback early on. Um, and what that really means is that we are maintaining an insider's channel besides the stable channel that you probably all heard of. Um, the insider channel is nightly updated with around 50,000 users by now. And what this means is that you can try out the changes from the previous day right on the next day. And more importantly, since the VS Code development team, all of us, we are using insiders, you can be sure that this version is actually good enough to use every day because otherwise we couldn't work on VS Code itself. Um, so to make sure to give that version a try uh, and give us feedback um, earlier than the stable channel that is updated only monthly. Um, we also have extensions shipping insiders versions, for example, the pull request uh, extension or the JS debug extension. You can uh, install them and try them out um, to benefit from, from features. And I should also say you can install insiders and stable side by side. And for example, use settings synchronization to uh, sync your extensions and settings over from both and, and use them at the same time, um, which I find actually quite nice. Less known is the exploration channel. Um, has around 100 users. We don't really advertise this. It's mainly used for Electron updates. Uh, Electron is the framework we use to, to ship cross-platform. And since it is a larger component, we try to still get some feedback, but maybe don't push it to insiders because there are just too many users there. So let's look at the last principle that we have, um, which is share recurring duties. We actually already talked about lots of these duties that we have in the team. Um, and we are trying to share these duties uh, across the team so that not everyone, not a single person has to do them all the time. Um, the inbox tracker is um, a weekly assignment that we run Robin between Zurich and Redmond. And as you already heard, is supported by bots and GitHub actions. Uh, and I should say that all the bots we talked about are actually open source. Um, so feel free to look at those repositories and actually use them for yourself. There's a build champion role. That's the same person as the inbox tracker. Um, that's the person that has to um, make sure that our insider builds are released every day and are fine. And then we have the endgame champion that runs the endgame. It's a monthly assignment. Um, and it's quite a job, I would say, because you have to run the endgame show for a week. Um, but you are assisted by the endgame body in the other time zone. And that is typically the endgame champion of the last iteration to hand it over. Um, yeah, so I think we reached the end of the presentation. Um, I would like to shout out um, our GitHub URL, um, Microsoft slash VS Code on GitHub, to really exercise this for yourself. Uh, look at our issues, look at our wiki pages, our roadmap, and engage with us.